It's a great pleasure for me to introduce the next speaker, uh, one of the uh, leading figures in the field, uh, David Sinclair. Are you there? Yes, I'm here, Morton. Hi. Hey, David. How's it going? Good, good. So, uh, David, whenever you're ready, you can start your slides and, uh, and we can uh, listen to your talk. Okay, sounds good. Hey everyone, it's great to be here. Okay, how's that showing? We good? It looks great. We just fantastic, really good. Thank you so much. Okay, all right, let's do this. Uh, okay, well, it's great to virtually be here. Sorry, I couldn't be there in person. Um, yeah, this has become the leading uh, conference on drug discovery in the aging field. So modern hats off to you and your team for getting this going. All right, so uh, what am I gonna talk about? We're gonna talk about a few things. There's some new work in the lab to do with uh, DNA methylation clocks. Uh, and I'll give you an update on how we're doing on the epigenetic reprogramming and age reversal stuff that we published uh, going back now about nine months ago. I think most people in the audience uh, know a lot about aging research. So I'm gonna just jump straight into it. Um, if you can't uh, follow, you know, there'll be questions at the end. So one of the, the theories that we've had in my lab, actually, since I was a postdoc at MIT, is the idea that the epigenome is important for aging. Um, and it's, it all started with the discovery of sirtuin genes um, as a regulator of yeast aging uh, with Brian Kennedy and Lenny Gorenti's work in the lab that I was in. Um, and... If you don't know, sirtuin, uh, where the name comes from, is a yeast gene called SIR2, S-I-R-2, and the I stands for information. And so sirtuins are epigenetic regulators. And the question was, what the heck is an epigenetic regulator gene silence are doing extending lifespan in yeast? And it turns out that these genes, these, these enzymes, which are uh, deacylases, do a couple of major things in the cell. Um, and many others, but the two major things they do is they control gene expression and maintain uh, youthful gene expression in yeast and in mammals. But they also are important, at least three of them, in nucleus for DNA repair um, and especially double-strand DNA breaks. And so we published this work now uh, a number of years ago, the yeast in 1999 in mammals 2008, where we said that perhaps one of the drivers of epigenomic noise, which we believe is a major contributor to the aging process. Um, may, maybe those are uh, double strand breaks are actually a major driver of that process. And you can see in this uh, summary that was uh, Jan Weig's um, companion to our cell paper shows that uh, in this case, CERT1, but we also know CERT7 and CERT T6 are distracted by double strand breaks. They move to the break, they help repair and then somehow they have to find their way back to where they came from to uh, reestablish gene expression as it was before. Uh, but this doesn't happen efficiently or 100%. And what we find is that if we do this in yeast cells, uh, and as I'll show you in mammals, you get uh, epigenomic drift or also known as epigenomic noise, uh, which we believe is a, um, a result of cells being co-regulating gene expression with DNA repair. And uh, if you know antagonistic pleiotropy, this predicts that what's good for you when you're young ends up being bad for you when you get old. Um, and so one of, the, one of the two questions that we have is, if you create this process in a mammal, does it accelerate aging? That it, we, we predict that it should. Um, and then if you reverse the process, you should get younger and organs and tissues should function like they're young again because their gene expression will be reset to a young state. Uh, so we built this uh, system in cells and in mice, and we've done this a lot over the last 10 years. I'll be just summarizing it. Uh, we have a system called the I system. It's inducible changes to the epigenome. Uh, and what we find when we induce double-stranded breaks that are not mutagenic, they just alter the epigenome, uh, we, we've now gone in and looked at this in three and four dimensions. And what I can tell you is that double-stranded breaks, even if they're repaired perfectly, 
they do alter chromatin um, in places that are very far away from the actual cut. Uh, the changes are heritable in cells. Um, we don't know about between uh, generations yet. Uh, interestingly, embryonic genes and particularly developmental genes are hotspots for these epigenetic changes. And this is just one example from the manuscript that we're uh, in the process of revising. You can look at it on bioarchives if you're keen. And this was work done in collaboration with Dovetail Genomics. And the Hox locus, you'll recall, is the locus that consists of uh, at least 13 uh, genes here that control our head from our tail during development. And during aging, the contacts between these various genes and uh, regions is altered. The, what you want to see is that the Cree is the control that was not cut. Uh, and we cut this for 24 hours and let the cells recover. Um, and then the ice cells that were treated, they lose a lot of these contacts. And in response, you get changes in histone modifications um, as well as uh, gene expression. So that's one thing that I want to drive home, which is that if you um, go and have an X-ray or you have a CT scan, your cells will have a memory of that event epigenetically and gene expression will not be the same. And we think that this is a driver of aging. And in fact, the epigenetic clock in these cells is advanced um, based on DNA methylation. So the mouse, uh, some of you have seen this mouse, but it's just, it's worth mentioning again, how striking this is. If we do three weeks of this treatment in an animal across all tissues, and we do this um, in a way that doesn't cause mutations, uh, it doesn't even cause any illness in these mice. Uh, if we wait 10 months, that's the untreated control uh, at 16 months of age. And this is the treated one. And these are epigenetically old. Uh, we can measure that. I'll show you how we measure clocks in my lab now. We have a new method. Uh, but this was done in collaboration with a number of labs, um, uh, Vadim's lab, as well as Zymo. But not, not just the clock is advanced. These mice actually are old. They're, they're physiologically old. Gene expression is old. Histologically, they're old. Um, and we can dial aging up as fast as we want. We can make this mouse get old in two months or 10 months or, or 13 months uh, because it's inducible, uh, dox, uh, tamoxifen inducible. Um, importantly, there's no increase in mutation. So what this is arguing is, first of all, this is, a, this is a Hail Mary experiment, right? It didn't have to work this way. These mice could have died. They could have gotten cancer. They didn't. They got aging. And so this is aging in the absence of mutations. Um, doesn't mean mutations aren't important, of course. You know, Jan's work is very important. But it does show that you don't need mutations to change the age of an animal. And this mouse on the right, on these mice, which we've looked at hundreds, probably a thousand or, or more now, are about 150% the age of the, of the controls. Um, so the, we, we've realized, I think all of us, that DNA methylation clocks are a little expensive if you want to test a million people and not very high throughput. Um, for instance, a Lumina DNA microarray, unless you get a super deal, uh, of you know, super bulk, you're still going to pay $150 to $300 per sample. Uh, and then you have to do RRBS, and that's in, you know, $250, $500 per sample. So that, that gives you across the genome, but it's still uh, fairly, fairly expensive um, if you do it in populations. Uh, so Patrick Griffin, who's a talented graduate student in the lab, decided to figure out a way to do this faster and cheaper. And he's come up with what he calls time seek, uh, tagmentation-based indexing for methylation sequencing. And basically what it's using is a transposon TN5 to insert barcodes uh, into sites that we want to sequence for DNA methylation. Uh, and so he uses that method. It works really well. Uh, you can then pull multiple samples of mouse DNA or human DNA, doesn't matter. Uh, and you can pull 96, you can you can pull a lot together and then that immediately reduces the cost uh, because you run, run them all in one sequencing run. Uh, and then we also do an enrichment step as well, which is uh, helpful to reduce the cost. So to give you an idea of how far this has come over the last few years, um, when we sequence the pools and then deconvolute the samples, there we get beautiful data coming out. That's an example of the primary data. We can look at particular CPGs. We can look at thousands of them at once. Uh, this is a mouse clock that 
Um, the mouse data is really, really quite beautiful. It's come out. You can see how well this works. And for this uh, current technology, we're less than $10. For example, uh, Patrick can process 600 in a couple of days. It's not a big deal anymore. And it'll just get cheaper and faster from here on. Um, we teamed up with uh, Alex, uh, who you heard earlier, uh, and Vadim. And we were amazed to see that even with shallow sequencing, we could get high levels of significance and age prediction. And the, the data that comes out of this is spectacular, better than we expected. And in fact, uh, this is very cheap. Uh, this is down, as it says there, to less than $2 a sample, which means that using this and getting it down even lower in price, we can literally be doing millions of people every few months. Um, what about the age reprogramming? So epigenetics is now very hot. Uh, we published a paper in December shown down in the bottom right. It's, it's not in press, it's actually published. Um, we were looking for ways to reset the epigenome, right? It, we were driving it forwards for 10 years, but we wondered, is there a backup copy of the earlier epigenome? And uh, we were inspired by uh, Juan, Juan Carlos Belmonte's work and Alex Ocampo, who showed in a prodroid mo model that four of the Yamanaka factors, when pulsed, uh, not continuous uh, could, instead of killing the mouse, make them healthier and live longer. Um, it didn't mean that it was necessarily age reversal, but we gave it a shot anyway. Uh, the real breakthrough came when Wen Cheng Lu, who's shown there, uh, left CMIC out and found that it was just as effective at reversing aging without causing tumors um, or making any, any kind of on oncogenic uh, signal. And the age actually of the cells in the fibroblasts and the neurons that we've worked with goes back to a certain point, let's say about 80%, and then stops. There's a barrier to going too young, which you don't want to do. You don't want to become a stem cell again. Um, and that's beautiful work also by Xiao Qian, um, and he came from Vera Gorbanova's lab. And so the system uh, is three genes in a cistron. It's uh, OSK, three of the Yamanaka genes, and we can turn this on and off with, with TET. Um, and we know that this maintains the identity of mouse and human cells and resets the gene expression from an old to a young state it takes just a matter of days in vitro and um, weeks in vivo. No induction of nanog or, or any sign of, of oncogenicity, which is a, a blessing. Uh, it's very safe. If you deliver it into a mouse systemically through IV using an AAV, there was no adverse effects. In fact, the mice that we were forced to sack to publish that paper had uh, a trend towards fewer, fewer tumors, not more. Um, and so we chose the central nervous system to reprogram for a number of reasons, um, including it's a nice, nice readout. We know that old neurons don't regrow and young ones do. But also we like the eye because that's a great place to start with human clinical trials because uh, the FDA has AAVs approved for treatment of the eye. Um, and so we took mice. This is a uh, in collaboration with the people on the bottom there, Jigang He and Benedict Brommer did this original experiment where we, we crushed the optic nerve to ask, can you make it regrow, which would be evidence that we could reverse aging. And this is no treatment where most of the, the optic nerve has died back towards the right where the brain is. But if we turn on those Yamanaka factors after the crush, we can maintain the survival of most of those neurons. And you can see that they even start to grow towards the brain. And if we leave them longer, instead of this is four weeks um, of, of induction, we actually uh, can now uh, leave it for 16 weeks and see that most of these, not most, but many of the nerves make it back to the brain. Um, so that was the beginning. We've, we've of course measured the age of these neurons. Um, this is the, and, and they are um, younger after the treatment. This is uh, more of, I think, a more impressive result looking at the, the methylome and you can see what a difference it is between the middle column, which is the untreated injured, and then the treated injured on the right. You can see how amazingly preserved the uh, or reversed the DNA methylation pattern is. Uh, and I want to call out um, Steve Horvath um, and, uh, and also Morgan Levine was instrumental in this work. Uh, we did glaucoma, that worked. We now have the ability to, even better than we published uh, on average, make the glaucoma mice uh, see again like they were uh, young. But the one that I like uh, is the old mice. So we took one-year-old black six mice, which do not see 
And you can tell that because they don't follow a moving screen. Uh, we treated them, and the, the treatment is on the right here with this OSK. Again, I think you can appreciate the broad uh, reversal of the DNA methylation patterns. Uh, how the cell knows which methylation patterns to restore is still unknown. Um, methylation age uh, was uh, reduced, as shown here. Uh, what I think is even more striking is that the, the gene expression patterns were restored, not just which gene, but by how much that gene should be restored. Uh, and that's represented because these um, RNA-seq results are along this diagonal up to the left. Um, and that's an extremely significant result. Um, this is the improvement in vision after the treatment in the red versus blue. Um, and one thing that we didn't expect is that when we compared the injured neurons in the first experiment versus aging, uh, there's an extremely high correlation. You can see the p-value there is more atoms than the universe. So what this tells us is very likely that injury, cellular injury, uh, also accelerates aging in the same way that, uh, that normal aging does. Okay, where are we going with this? Well, <clears throat> this is work uh, by Xiao Qian, and, and this is, uh, these are brain organized by Jae Hyun Young in the lab, both postdocs. And we're now working with uh, human tissue. We've reprogrammed iPSCs that have the ICE system and the OSK reversal system in them. Uh, these have brain activity, they grow nicely. They're a mix of cells of neurons and astrocytes and microglia. Um, they're also genetically different. There are wild type human samples and APOE from patients that developed Alzheimer's disease. And our goal is to be testing genetic and chemical modifiers to uh, reverse the, the aging process and see if that will cure Alzheimer's disease. One of the nice things about this system is that most brain organoids are young because they come from iPSCs, but we can rapidly, we think, age them by using this ICE system that I showed you in those mice. Uh, and so what I've said is um, that we think that a large part of aging is epigenetic noise, um, which can be driven by double strand breaks, which we experience a billion times a day in our bodies, or cellular injury. There's probably other drivers as well, but we know this, re this re uh, reprogramming is possible. In You can use OSK. There's probably other ways we'll figure out, and we're working on that. And it, I didn't tell you this, but that reprogramming in the recovery of vision requires TET1 and TET2, which are DNA demethylases. Um, and so the the point is um, perhaps the, the DNA methylation pattern and represented by the clock isn't just simply a clock. It's actually participating in aging and required for its reversal. Um, and we're excited about applying this to other tissues and organs. We've got preliminary and exciting results in the whole brain, driving aging forwards and backwards in, in living brain tissue in mice, muscle, skin, um, and very, very old skin cells. And so it, it where we're going with this ultimately is we hope to be able to figure out a way in our lifetimes to reprogram our entire bodies to be young again and hopefully reset multiple times. Um, I think you all know me. Uh, I don't just sit on publications. We spun out a paper, uh, not a paper, a company in 2017. <clears throat> this uh, is called Life Biosciences. Um, collaborators and co-founders in, include um, Horvath, Serrano, and Belmonte. Uh, and this platform has three technologies. Well, this company has three platform technologies, which are listed here. Uh, I've talked a bit about the epigenetic reprogramming so that they're headed into primate studies this year and hopefully a year later, uh, IND uh, submission for human blindness uh, treatment, whether it be glaucoma or uh, other uh, rarer diseases. The other platforms are mitochondrial uncoupling, which is a, a wonderful weight loss medicine, which is also actually further advanced towards uh, um, drug development. That is uh, a set of chemicals that uncouples mitochondria in a safe way. We know that if you do it, uh, if you overdo it, it can be unsafe, but these molecules have a fail safe mechanism that prevents any overdosing by anyone who wants to rapidly lose weight. Um, and so I'm hoping that that'll be a, a treatment um, and a, a solution to the world's obesity problem, but also these molecules also 
mimic fasting in animals as well. So that's the reason that I'm excited about them from an aging perspective. Uh, and then Anna Maria Cuervo and her labs and, and Everest, her wonderful collaborator uh, who does the chemistry are down at Albert Einstein College of Medicine. And they are working hard on um, activators of chaperone mediated autophagy to mimic fasting, deep fasting, like three days of fasting. And Anna Maria has published a Nature in a Cell paper on this this year um, and it's pretty exciting that that's also uh, rapidly moving towards human uh, clinical trials uh, and just to finish up and take some questions i want to thank the people that did the work on the left are my lab members part of the epigenetics team Wan chang was the first author of the niche paper also greatly helped by many of the people listed uh, and those underlined did the majority of the work collaborators the cassandra lab vadim's lab uh, morgan steve jigang her um, and George Church and Noah helped us a lot with the viruses and many of other people along the way. Um, and thanks to the people that funded it to make it possible. I'll take questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you for a, a great talk, David. We have some uh, questions on Slack. Uh, there is a question that's been upvoted here uh, from Shiva, Shivai Pariha. What role do you think the Sirtuin genes play in the reprogramming process? Well, <clears throat> I'll tell you what I think, and then I'll tell you what I know. Um, I think they play a key role in the reprogramming process, that without them, um, at least the ones in the nucleus, it, it, it's not going to be efficient, and it may not work. Uh, and we are working on that right now. Uh, I also am, am curious as to whether activating some of these sirtuins will increase the uh, efficiency of reprogramming, and that we're actively testing as well. What do I know for sure? Uh, nothing, but we're in the middle of, of trying to figure out if that they do really play a role, but all the evidence points to them playing an important role. All right, thank you very much. Um, there's a, um, another there's a question here in the audience, sorry. Hi, David. Nice talk. Thank you for sharing the data. Just was wondering, this strategy of reprogramming works in the same way for different tissues and cells, or do you need to optimize it, depending on the tissue? Yeah, so, so far we haven't been unsuccessful at reprogramming a tissue. And I, I know Manuel Serrano is going to be putting out work saying that he's been successful reprogramming a variety of internal organs in, in mice. Um, but I, I don't know the answer to that yet. I think that it's surprising how universal it is. But what we've noticed that might be helpful is the dosing seems to be diff, have, different tissues have different dosing requirements of OSK. And some tissues such as the brain can handle a lot and some tissues such as muscle prefer a lot less. And so the trick is going to be, if we're going to do all, all tissues at once, is to make sure we hit the sweet spot. Mm -hmm. And do you use the DNA methylation profile to calibrate the reprogramming? Are you there, David? David? Martin, you might... I think you have to repeat the question because you broke so, up. Sorry, I was just asking whether you use the DNA methylation profile to calibrate the dosage of the reprogramming. How do I calibrate the dosage? Yes. Um, okay. Yeah, so we have a number of ways. We can use different amounts of virus, but we can also use um, doxycycline, which is able to be titrated. Um, no, and we can also get different promoters that are tissue specific. I mean, it was chosen also based on the DNA methylation profile. Is that the parameter that tells you the reprogramming work enough efficiently? Uh, no, we generally look at gene expression and mm -hmm. toxicity. Uh, and in the case of muscle, there was, there was in vivo toxicity if we expressed it very highly. So we had okay, to... Yes use less docs uh, and less virus. Okay, All right. thank you. Thank you very much, David. Really interesting and thought-provoking uh, talk. And we really appreciate you being here. Let's give David another round of applause. <laughs>